was to say to you that all human movement was movement around a circle, would you go, come on, come on, Sims. I've seen a runner running down a track and they're going in a straight line. But I am telling you, all, all human, all human movement, and I'm going to say it a little controversially here, is in circles and you're thinking what how can that be the case well let me see if i can sort of express this and try and convince you we have we have a bowler here for example uh bummer i think it is and what we could say here for example if we were look at t if we were to look at this bowling shoulder of course what the shoulder is going to do imagine the shoulder now going through flexion down into adduction and so on this shoulder is going to make what circle what about this hip what about if i was to go here this hip is effectively capable of going from here to here in this particular action what about the ankle here's the ankle look what it can do it can point downwards part circle that's plantar flexion obviously it can point upwards dorsi flexion part circle so we are stressing here that all human movement is in circles now we've got a name for this it's not really the direction of today's lesson but it's called angular motion and we'll come back to that perhaps in other studies. But what I want to do here now is start to introduce to you how this relates to levers. Now, sadly, I had to take my shirt off for this photo. <laughs> I wish. Um, but here we've got, we've got like a bicep curl going on. And I want you to imagine that this arm is kind of curling up. We call it a curl, right? A part circle. Imagine it's curling up in this direction. It's the up phase. So what is the role of levers within this? Well, the first thing we must have, and I should stress here, there are four components to every lever. There are four components. And of course, it's levers that are going to produce this circular angular motion. We've got four components. The first component we must have is this one. We have a lever arm, okay? We sometimes call it a lever bar, okay? But it's called a lever arm. It's effectively a solid rod. Now, what would this be in this case? Well, it's actually the radius in the forearm. We've got a lever arm, a bone in this case, a long bone, right? What else do we need to have? Well, we need to have some kind of pivot point or fulcrum. So we would call this a fulcrum, okay, or a pivot. You can use the word pivot, it's absolutely fine. And of course here it's the elbow joint, which we've just seen, you know, especially if you can imagine this uh, elbow joint was bending, it could, it could flex here, it could extend here. That's not the action in bowling, of course. What else do we have? Well, we have a load. In this case, we've got the dumbbell, right? This is called a load or a resistance. So we need that for a lever to operate. And finally, folks, we must have what we refer to as an effort. And in this case, we have the bicep, which is, of course, here, impressive on this particular person. We've got this bicep, and it's inserted down. If I just change color, it would be inserted down as a radius about here. And, of course, when it contracts upwards like this, guess what happens? We get this curling. We get this curling of this dumbbell in this way. So let me just stress that. We call that red arrow, arrow or the... Uh, contraction of the muscle the effort okay so we've got our one two three four components one two three four components of a lever now we could go a lot further with this and we could talk about all kinds of things here but where I want to shift our attention now is what we call the classification of levers classification of levers let me choose a nice pink to show this the classification of levers because there are more than one types of lever and they all perform slightly different functions and we'll come to that come to that towards the end of the tutorial now you've got to remember a, a little rhyme in order to really be able to identify different lever classifications so it goes like this for one two three think see if i can get the same colors think f L, I'm not sure I did. Think E. For one, think F. For two, think L. For three, think E. Now, what on earth am I banging on about here? Well, we can tell which lever is which by which component is in the middle. Now, by definition, of course, the lever arm can't be in the middle. It's the solid bar. Everything's attached to it, right? So we're asking, is the fulcrum in the middle? Is the load in the middle? Or is the effort in the middle? So I'd like you to look at our bicep curl and which of these is in the middle. Now, if you're saying to me, James, the effort's in the middle, but it's not bang smack in the middle. It's sort of between the other two. You would be right. So we're saying the effort is between the other two. So the effort is between the other two. This must be a third class lever now what we're going to do from here forward is we're going to clar uh, cl clarify that as well but we're going to classify some other levers let us talk about first class levers 
Now, these types of levers are not overly common in the human body, but there are a couple of really good examples, and we've got them here. We've got the example of neck extension. So we've used the sporting application here of uh, a seated volleyball player uh, focusing upwards into the air by leaning their head back to focus on the ball and to play a set shot. But look what we've got, guys. We've got our fulcrum in the middle. We've got our, that of course is the neck joint, and I would like you to refer to that ideally as the atlas and axis joint. Let me write that down for you. Atlas and axis joint, okay? Now, lots of people say that this, in fact, even AQ, AQA say it's the joint between the top vertebra and the cranium. That's actually not true. It's a joint between the top two vertebra. Anyway, we're not gonna go into that, but just if you wanna go study it, go Google it, you'll see what I mean. It's, it's a joint between C1 and C2 vertebrae. Anyway, that's a whole other story, but the point is this one. The fulcrum is between the effort in this case, the effort is the contraction of the sternocleidomastoid. You've probably come across this uh, muscle already, and you know it's a breathing muscle. But here, it's able to pull and pull on the head and pull downwards like this. And of course, the, the weight or the load or the resistance is the weight of the head. And that is now lifted up. And that's where we get neck extension. Now, the other one we've got is elbow extension. I might, you might be thinking, well, is everything extension? Um, a, a first class lever. The answer to that is no. And lots of people get this one confused, guys. Let's let's go through it carefully. The fulcrum is the elbow. So nothing shocking about that. There's the fulcrum. It's the elbow joint just there. The effort is the tricep contracting. Now, this is the key thing. The tricep, which of course is kind of here-ish, right? It inserts down onto the very point of the elbow. Look, it's to the right of the elbow. It's the back point of the ulna. You can call it your funny bone if you want. Don't do that in the exam, but that's what it is. The tricep there. And of course, this fighter here is effectively lifting the load, which is their forearm. You know, they're propelling their forearm and their glove forward to strike the opponent in sort of like a, it looks like a an uppercut, uppercut jab shot somehow, right? But this is extending. Effectively, the arm is straightening to do this at the elbow. So here, of course, oh, even though the tricep and the elbow, uh, tricep insertion and the elbow are very close together, the elbow is the central feature between the other two. That means the fulcrum is in the middle for one, two, three, think F, L-E, we've got a we've got a first class lever. Next one, let's move to the example of plantar flexion, folks. Plantar flexion. We all love a bit of plantar flexion at the at the at the elbow, at the ankle, even. So what we've got here is effectively the toes being pointed. So what's happening here is we've got an effort, haven't we? Now the effort is the gastrocnemius muscle. Here it is. It's got a long tendon surrounded by a sheath that comes down onto the heel here, and it's pulling in that direction via the Achilles tendon. So it's pulling the heel up, the toes down. Okay, that's what it's doing. So we've got that as our. Let's put it in there. We've got that gastrocnemius attaching to the heel. We call it inserting if you want to use that term. We've also got the load. The load is here. It's body weight. It's body weight and it acts down via the tibia because that's where the center of mass acts. And of course then we have got the fulcrum. Now in this case people often say the ankle is the fulcrum but it's actually the contact point between the ball. Let me choose a different color. The ball of the foot and the floor. Okay, now this is where plantar flexion is generated. Now what do we have? Body weight is the central component, not necessarily in the middle middle, but between the other two, we've got plantar flexion. But uh, load is in between the other two components. Therefore, for one, two, three, think F, L, load, E, it's got to be a second. It's got to be a second class lever system. Now we're gonna come back to these in a second. Finally, We've got our third class lever system. Now, we've already looked at the bicep curl, and I'm pretty sure you could probably just fill that in for yourself. But just to clarify, we've got the elbow, which is the um, fulcrum. We've got the bicep, which is inserting down onto the radius, unlike the tricep, which inserts down onto the ulna. And then we've, of course, got the dumbbell. So what do we have in the middle? We have the effort in the middle. For one, two, three, think F-L-E, effort. This is a third class. What I'd like to maybe spend a touch more time on is something we haven't looked at. What about something like knee flexion? What about prepare? You know, this is obviously a dance move, but what about if we were preparing to kick a rugby ball? Say, same idea. We flex the knee in preparation for the kick. So what have we got? We've got the knee, which is the fulcrum. Lovely. We've got the effort here. This is um, the hamstrings. Now, the hamstrings insert onto a couple of different bones, but we're going to say, oh, let's just call it onto the lower leg. So there's hamstrings pulling in that direction. And the load, of course, is leg weight. 
and because we have got our F in the middle, we have got for one, two, three, think F-L-E, we've got a third class lever system. Now, just a little tip for you, if you're, if you're answering questions about levers in the exam and you get a question and you're really not sure what the classification is, obviously I prefer you were sure, but third class are very numerous. Okay, so we've only got three examples in the human body that are not third class levers. So if you really do have to plant for one, then you want to think about third class that way. But obviously, we'd, we'd rather know plantar flexion is a class two. We'd rather know that neck extension and elbow extension are class one. Now, we're going to finish this off, folks, and we're going to talk about mechanical advantage. And in order to do this, and this is the roles these levers play, other than creating circles, we want to understand mechanical advantage. We want to understand how different sort of lever construction affects their um, you know, contribution or how they do things, right? So what have we got here? We've got a second class lever at the ankle. Now imagine we're plantar flexing like this, we're going up on the toes. And we have a third class lever all, all over here because we're doing a bicep curl. We've looked at this already. Now this is the point I want you to make. I'm gonna use a nice red line here. I want you to compare the distances or, or the relative distances. If I was to draw perpendicularly from here to here, this distance between the effort and the fulcrum is called an effort arm. If I was to draw a blue line, if I was to say the distance from the fulcrum to the resistance or the load, this is called the load arm. Now, can you see for a third class lever, the effort arm is relatively short compared to the load arm? You'd agree with that, right? Well, what about a second class lever? Let's have a look at this. Here's the F, oh, my pen's not working. Here's the effort arm, here's the load arm. Now, would you agree with me that in second class lever systems, the effort arm is longer than the load arm compared to other lever systems? Now, that's critical because mechanical advantage actually equals effort arm divided by, and you could literally measure it, of course, divided by load arm. So in other words, if we have a long effort arm, mechanical advantage is high. If this is long and this is short, this is high. Now, that's all fine. We could literally measure that. We could get the ruler out and measure our ankles, probably. But let's actually say why this support. Why does this matter? This is why it matters. Because, and crucially, mechanical advantage, so let's assume it's high mechanical advantage, They can these types of levers can overcome large load so hang on a second we have got one of these at the ankle and that supports body weight james overcoming large loads interesting what about this not only that but it requires relatively little effort hang on james you're telling me that this lever formation that's at the ankle can lift heavy loads body weight but it can also do it without it feeling really really heavy isn't that interesting isn't evolution great and finally, guys, the downside. So I'm going to write these in red, actually. Unfortunately, <laughs> mechanical advantage comes with some downsides. Short range of motion. motion. It's not very uh, flexible. And finally, the other downside, downside is we get limited speed. So final point from me, folks. We have got mechanical advantage, lots of force, overcome large loads, not much effort, but not flexible and not fast. So it's not really on our spec. What do you think mechanical, if I just put mech, disadvantage is? And you might want to go back to our definition here. Discuss it with your teacher. See if you can come up with it. But the one thing I will tell you is that something with mechanical disadvantage has high ROM and high speed of motion. And of course, that is the majority of the levers in our body. So that's what we are specialized towards. Cheers.